the Divorce is Not an Option podcast. It's your man's Stephen James Dixon, Tamara Gillespie. Please be sure to subscribe and follow our podcast on all podcast platforms. Don't just listen to an episode. Subscribe to follow the podcast. To subscribe, search for the name Divorce is Not an Option on your podcast platform of choice. The purpose of subscribing is so that each week when we produce a new episode, that episode will be delivered to your mobile device or email automatically, seamlessly, effortlessly. You don't have to do anything. You just get it. It just it just come right in. You just get a message, bing, pop up, hey, new episode, divorce not an option, check it out. We appreciate those of you who listen on Facebook to our podcast, but you cannot subscribe to Facebook. You can only subscribe on podcast platforms like iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher, just to name a few. For any questions on how to subscribe to the Divorce is Not Option podcast, email me, ask at stephenjamesdixon.com. Okay, Tamara's out this week uh, on a honeymoon, got married last week, beautiful wedding. Husband's a real cool dude. Do you know I waited to, to holler at my man? You know, um, for like two hours at the reception, and you know, I'm patient. You know, I'm not family. You know, you got to talk to family and do that thing or whatever at the wedding. And do you know that I waited for two hours to talk to dude? He knew I was waiting to talk to him. As soon as I get to talking to him, somebody came and pulled rank on me, like a cousin or some. Was like they was leaving. Just, just pull rank on me. It was cool. Though. I understand. That's how the weddings go, man. I'm glad everybody was happy. Everybody had a good time. It was a lot of fun. It was a good evening out with my wife and, you know, and I, we don't get many evenings out. So we had a lot of fun. Um, quick things, uh, I have, and then I'm gonna just play some, uh, chapters from the audio book, Men Don't Heal We Hope. Uh, I'm gonna play chapters nine and ten. Um, the advice I kind of gave Tamara was that I always give people when they get married and whatever I give people who are, I do premarital coaching with is that don't do nothing for two years. That's my advice. Don't do nothing, but love each other, pay attention to each other and make each other the primary focus of your everyday thing to build your foundation, to build your base. Don't have a baby. Don't buy a new car. Don't buy a new house. Don't move. Just sit down, be still, and be into your spouse for the first two years. Nobody ever listens, but I think that's real. Um, another quick thing this week, progress report. I had a single woman finally call me and say, I've been going through this with her for about five years of coaching off and on. And she finally gets now that she has to respect herself. And she finally just learned that she has to be the one to guide her relationships. Like women have intuition and they have to follow the intuition and they have to know how a relationship should progress. And so, you know, you're dating and then it becomes more serious and then you're having sex and then you fall in love. And then what? And men are usually stuck at then what? Cause as long as we have sex, we good. Like once we get the booty, like we don't need nothing else. There's no other goals for us in a relationship. And so women have to then set that path to say, Hey, I'm not just giving you some free milk. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to get this whole cow, you know, and all that, you know what I'm saying? So that's up to the woman though, to lay that out and to say, Hey, I'm looking to get married. I'm looking to have a family. I'm looking to, you know, do more serious things besides date and have sex. And so she finally learned that one of my clients just finally learned and she, and it was tough for her. Cause she, you know, she's a cute girl and she's always dating superstars and entertainers and all that kind of stuff. And she finally just got that. Hey, if she doesn't have standards and, and self-respect and values herself, that she will never get married because she just finally learned that with the guy that she's dating now. She's like, look, I was just very real with this dude in terms of what he wants. The funny thing is with women is I'm always telling women to say what they want. I never tell a guy to say what you want. Guys always know what they want, which is very simple. We want the sex. Um, last note, uh, relationship story from the week. I had a couple in the other day. And, um, basically I said to the wife that the husband deserves a bad bitch. And, uh, and you know, that's just how I feel. Like all husbands deserve bad bitches, like be a bad bitch. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's whatever he interprets that to be or whatever you y'all agreed upon when y'all got married, you know, apparently he was attracted to you when you got married. Don't super change during the marriage and feel like the man is supposed to be attracted to you the same way. You know, all men are attracted to whatever they're attracted to. So if he, you know, if you different from what you was when you got married, you need to fix that. And so I talked to some women 
over, over the past week, it's been about three different women I met with and really just told them straight up lose weight. Straight up. Be real about it. Let's just lose weight. Like, And I don't look at it as, I know some people have diseases and it's serious and things of that nature. But to me, it's it's more so about how do I be my best spouse? So in the same fashion, I was talking to the woman about losing weight. I was talking to the man about being affectionate because the man was on some, I'm not affectionate. I wasn't raised in an affectionate family. My mom didn't hug me. My dad didn't hug me. Nobody told me they loved me. And I was like, okay, I don't care. What does that have to do with your marriage today? And your wife deserves affection and intimacy and love and appreciation and compassion and empathy. She deserves those things. She's a woman. Give them to her. Figure it out. And so I look at, you know, if you got to lose weight to make your man happier or you got to be more affectionate and make your woman happier or whatever it is you got to do to make you a better spouse, that's what you need to do. So uh, we're going to talk, we're going to call this every, every husband desire, every husband deserves a porn star. Cause I had an argument about that with another couple one day where a wife was like, he think I'm supposed to be a porn star. Uh, yeah. If you're not his porn star, who is? Here we go. Listen to the chapters. Chapter 9, Chapter 10, Men Don't Heal, We Hope. Make sure y'all get a copy of the book. It's everywhere. iTunes, um, SoundCloud, Spreaker, uh, Spotify. Listen to it. Tell a friend. And definitely start taking your love capacity quizzes. 2017. Let's see how your love capacity increased from 2016. Tell a friend. Tell a family member. Hashtag lovecapacity.com. Appreciate you guys. Episode 13. Your husband deserves a porn star. Chapter 9. Becoming a man of God. Um, okay, we're gonna pause right there. Uh I did not know chapter nine was becoming a man of God. <laughs> Any other episode or podcast, I could have went with that chapter right there. But now that I done called the episode Your Husband Deserves a Porn Star, then we go right to chapter nine to becoming a man of God. Woo. Um yeah, that's a little much, but you know what? Let's just do it like that. Honest to God, I did not plan it like that. Uh, if you go back and look at my other episodes, um, I just roll out chapters of the audio book whenever Tamara and I cannot record. So I did not intentionally call this episode, um, your husband deserves a porn star and then intentionally roll out chapter nine. I really don't have time to really do production and all of that kind of stuff and strategizing and planning I kind of just roll in after doing relationship coaching after being with the family and whatnot and say hey let me put something together for the fans for the people for my folks that are listening to the podcast just try to enjoy it just just let me ride on this one let me slide uh Tamara's I'm sure gonna gonna let me have it next week because she's not gonna understand why I couldn't just but I'm not about to skip a chapter in an audio book that don't really make sense either it's really a no-win situation just let me ride on this one you know what i'm saying if y'all don't go hard in the comments if y'all got something y'all want to say a little bit take a shot at me a joke here there you can do that in the feedback it's all good just let me ride on this one so let's do that again <laughs> chapter nine becoming a man of god nine months of my life are gone i could have had a baby by now I'm just sitting around waiting on a woman that's not coming back. She's moved on with her new man. Your man is just a tad bit depressed. I take this one hard. Three times I've tried to love a woman. One time I really, really liked one of their kind. All three times it did not work out. This time it's not like the divorce though. I'm not running around upset at the world and mad at all women. I'm just disappointed in the outcome. I sacrificed a lot. For the first time in my life, my best was not good enough. The choice was not mine. It was hers. She left. For the first time in my life, a woman left me. I don't understand. I lost. I don't know what to do or where to turn. So I do what everyone else does when they recognize that they're stupid. I turn to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Figure I might as well live, right? God has been very patient with me. Watching and waiting, protecting and saving, blessing me. Meanwhile, I consistently disappoint him. Not anymore. I've been hurt three times now. And I want God to protect me from further pain. So I'm going to live for God now. I'm going to live up to his expectations that he has for me. I've always done everything that I wanted to do, and I'm not happy. I'm going to try things his way. Joy and happiness are of God. My heart has been broken. 
I did not trust or follow him. I have done everything on my own without him. I have failed in everything that I've tried to do. With God on my side, I will succeed. Life cannot present an obstacle that my God cannot overcome. I cast my cares away. My worries, he takes as his own. My problems, he disposes of. I believe that God died for my sins and he will order my steps if I allow him to. I will live in peace because God is peace and I will live through him. I can't count the times that God has forgiven me. Not just the sex, but the sex with that man's wife, with that man's fiance, with my girl's best friend, with my boy's woman. With his baby mama, the lies, the stealing, the misleading, the robbing him of his ties, the days without prayer, the weeks without praise, going months without visiting him or talking to him or reading his word. Some days I wouldn't even bless my food. I would repeatedly cry out to Denise, why are we unhappy? What can I do? She could never answer. It wasn't her fault. I was asking the wrong person. I needed to ask my Lord and Savior. I shall request his direction, and everything that I do. Should I accept this job opportunity? Is this the right house for me? Can I afford this car? Am I ready to start dating again? Did you choose this woman for me? I will ask God for his blessings on everything that I do. I need to relearn how to love. Actually, I need to learn how to love for the first time. I need to learn how to love through God. A spiritual love, agape. The only true love is God's love. If you don't love through God, then you're not loving. You're lusting. Godly relationships are successful and are set up as a triangle. God is at the top of the triangle. Man and woman at the bottom. Man and woman, as they grow closer to God, they will automatically grow closer to each other. What I've learned from experience is that love is not enough to make a relationship work. Good looks don't matter at 3 o'clock in the morning during that fight. Money can run out and can be remade. Communication is important, but what if your mate is talking about some stupid mess that you don't want to hear? I have grown closer to God. God will protect me from all pain and suffering that I've been putting myself through. I open my heart and I ask God to enter me and save me. Without hesitation, God takes over my body and starts to use me to do his work. I start to enjoy church. I'm having more fun at church than I was at any time in my life. I'm learning and retaining God's word at an unbelievable rate. Next thing you know, I'm ministering to other people, sharing God's word, his grace, his mercy, his love. A good friend decides to start a Bible study group. We come up with a name, G-I-F-T, Growing in Faith Together, G-I-F-T, gives me more reason to read God's word. I am just studying the word leisurely now, reading and learning for fun. I have a responsibility now. God is using me. I have to be on my toes. I bring my Bible with me everywhere I go. All of my conversations are about Jesus. I am paying my tithes. I am living right. I'm not even worried about no woman. Nine months have gone by in a blink of an eye, and I haven't been on a date, and I've remained completely celibate. God leads me to build a house. God is protecting me from pain and suffering. I am happy. Like I said, I'm not even worried about no woman. I'm out to dinner with some friends. I end up sitting next to a beautiful woman named Danielle. She's mad cool, minding her own business, kind of quiet and to herself. I haven't talked to a woman in months, but my spirit tells me it's okay to talk to this woman. As I silently bless my food, I ask God about Danielle right there at the dinner table. God, if this woman is not for me, please send me a sign and send her away. Then she smiles at me. I get those digits. Driving home, I thank God for Danielle. I feel that she's a blessing from him. I promise God that I will not defile his blessing by fornicating. I promise God that I will not revert to my old ways of sinning. I promise God that I will always represent him and spread his word about his greatness. I promise to continue being a spiritual leader, the leader that he created. I won't let you down, Father. Father, I love you and I'm ready for a wife and to start a family. I pray. Danielle is cool, God-fearing, church-going, good woman, good conversation. We have a lot of things in common. We talk on the phone for hours. I feel a strong connection between us. She confirms that she feels it too. Just as I promised God, I keep praying and praising. I know that Danielle was sent to me from him. We are in church faithfully, twice a week, sometimes more. We make every day a revival. We become inseparable. We go everywhere together. She's the one. I know it. I'm convinced. 
I pray over her and us every day. How can we go wrong with God on our side? She's a homeowner, keeps her house clean, can throw down in the kitchen. After one month of being together, she tells me that she loves me. Three months in, I'm shopping for the ring. I have never moved this fast before with a woman, but I'm confident in my talks with God that Danielle is the one. If you know you got the one, why wait? After gaining approval from her parents, I get down on one knee and I ask Danielle to marry me on the 4th of July at the family reunion. Through the screaming and shouting for joy, yelling and surprise, I hear my love say, yes, yes, she will marry me. Wouldn't you know that as soon as she said yes, she changed? All of a sudden, she expects our relationship to be perfect, expects us to be different from what we are. We're engaged now. Maybe I'm supposed to be more mature or something. I didn't get the memo. I'm the same cat that you said yes to the other day. I didn't change. Why did you change? Why are you trying to change me? Don't expect me to change. Expect me to stay the same. She expects us not to argue, not to fight. We all just perfect now, I guess we supposed to be. Now I'm supposed to know what she's thinking. Just like that, we are, we twins now, I guess. I'm supposed to know her inner thoughts. I'm supposed to talk a certain way. I'm supposed to act a certain way. I'm supposed to be a certain way to her. She says things like, I can't believe you would say that to your future wife. Or, I can't believe my future husband would talk to me like that. All disagreements become arguments. All arguments become fights. All fights become, why am I marrying you again? It's weird. I now have to figure out who she wants me to be, who she expects me to be, who she thinks she's marrying, who she wants her husband to be. All of those people are me. I'm walking on eggshells. She is taking everything I say the wrong way. She's easily offended, easily shocked, easily disappointed. I'm supposed to be some kind of Superman now. I am shell shocked and surprised for weeks. And then I snap out of it. This is the work of the devil. We have let our guard down. Fornication has allowed the devil to sneak into our relationship. We aren't getting our jackrabbit on or anything like that, but we had a couple slip ups. We have to repent, recommit, rededicate, get prayed up, shake that devil off, gain a positive attitude, a positive outlook. I got to calm down my future wife. Let her know that everything is going to be all right. Marriage counseling time. The fact that I'm divorced has no impact on me now. Yeah, I learned a, you know, a couple things. I learned how hard it is to stay married. I still love her, but I don't want to be with her. I want to marry Danielle because I love Danielle. God sent her to me. He sent me a wife. What's the difference between then and now? I'm a grown man now. I was a boy then. She's a wonderful woman. She's down for me. Takes care of me. Got my family. She's an independent thinker. I love that. She's strong. She got backbone. She warms my heart. I am excited when I pull up to the house every day. As soon as she pulls into the driveway, my day gets better. I miss her when she's not around. When she's close, I want to be closer. I knew I would marry her the moment I met her. I tell the counselor. Then it's her turn to talk to the marriage counselor. James is the best man I ever dated. He is so good to me and my son. He's loving and caring and always shows a lot of concern. He's family oriented, spiritual, which is good. He's fun and down to earth. He's just overall a good man, you know? No, he's not perfect. He's very demanding, hard to please, a little bit nitpicky, dominant sometimes, you know, aggressive. He's sweet though. But he's tough and exhausting. I love him. I know he loves me. It's just hard sometimes. He's very controlling. What she said about me is 100% correct. I am tough to deal with. I know that. I'm trying to get better at that. Trying to get softer. Trying to be less controlling. I don't ask for more than I give, though. It's the way that I give that is the problem. Counseling helps a lot. We complete the five-week program. We learn some things, both good and bad and continue with our wedding plans. Like most couples, we have our share of battles over the wedding plans. Well, actually, we fight a lot over the wedding plans. The fights never get ugly like before, but they hurt more. With each fight, we are growing further and further apart, and our fights change in nature. Now our fights are more me against her and her against me. We aren't on the same team anymore. We acknowledge that our fighting is a bad sign and cancel the wedding. I feel that she isn't ready to marry me. Not her fault, my fault. I should have seen it coming. I should have known better. Canceling the wedding hurts me the most. I'm embarrassed. 
I can't acknowledge how deeply I'm hurt. I've tried really, really hard and failed. I asked for my ring back. She thinks that giving the ring back is a bad move. She doesn't want the engagement broken off. She's just not ready to get married. She still loves me. She still wants to be with me. I still love her. I still want to be with her. But I want my ring back. I just don't feel the same. I've been in love, married, divorced, in love, broken up with, in love, engaged, and now another engagement is broken off. I've tried all three paths, marriage, engagement, and love, all unsuccessful. Is it me? Wrong woman? Wrong women? Wrong place? Wrong time? Am I not ready? Am I undeserving? Lord knows I've tried. When I love, I love hard, all the way, no limits. Love the wrong ones. Didn't love the right ones. Don't know about love. Drained now. No energy for any relationships. No patience for no woman, no mess, no drama. It has got to be effortless for the next relationship because I'm tired. No more praying. Not mad at God. I'm not mad at God. Just don't even want to talk about God. I'm just keeping it real. Okay, I might be a little mad at God. God fearing church going about God's business, a believer. I just don't know what God is doing with my life. Why did God say Danielle was to be my wife? Why did he say that? I prayed over Danielle. I know God spoke to me about her. God sent Danielle to me. How can it not work? How can we not be together? What is God teaching me? What is God doing with my life? It is easy for us to become full of doubt, anger, and resentment when relationships do not work. We can look to every good part of the relationship as a sign from God when things are going well. But when things go badly, we often want to distance ourselves from God or wonder why he is turned against us. In my case, I wonder why God was pushing me away from her. I've spoken with many people, both men and women, who allow a bad relationship or a rough time to damage their prayer lives. You got to keep praying. They stop going to church. You got to keep going to church. They stop being active in ministries. You got to keep being active. You can't stop reading your Bible. These things are normal. They happen. But we must also guard ourselves against seeing our own relationships failing as a failure of God. God never fails. Sometimes we interpret what we hear as a word from God, but it just may be our own desires speaking louder than God. Well, actually, we can't speak louder than God, but we can listen to ourselves harder than we listen to God. Consider your approach to your relationship and to God. Do you look to God as only an ally, someone to give you the go ahead for what you want to do when it comes to dating or marriage? Or do you truly seek his counsel, his voice, even if he says something that you don't want to hear? Being honest about this will help you see more clearly your decisions and your path. Why me, God? That's something I uttered often after the broken engagement. This relationship nonsense is just too difficult. After that last breakup, I'm starting to think that the only person I could be with is me. I knew what I needed. I knew what would make me happy. I have never disappointed myself, never hurt my feelings. I will never leave me. As far as I'm concerned, I can't find anybody like me. That was an emotional time for me. It is for a lot of people. I did not know how to deal with my emotions. I have found through my research and conversations with other people that we're all having problems handling our emotions. Men are just not equipped for dealing with this. Men can deal with women's emotions, but we were never taught to handle our emotions. We often end up in denial and don't know it, or we know it and we don't want to admit it. We won't tell our friends, our family, or the fellas. Shoot, the fellas will never know the truth. A dude can't tell another dude he's hurt. No dude wants to say that. No dude wants to hear that. Fellas don't console each other. We punch each other in the mouth. If we're caught sitting around crying over a woman. But my heart was broken and I didn't know how to heal it. The fact that I was finally able at this stage in my life to admit to myself that my heart was broken was a big step. This showed growth from the early days with Denise and later with Monique. My personal evolution was taking place. Most of the time men are too busy faking like it doesn't hurt to heal. So we don't heal. We never heal. We hope. Hoeing has always solved all of our problems. Or at least we pretend that the problems have been solved. All we're really doing is replacing a problem with another problem. What do you think a man is going to do? Sit at home for six months and cry himself back to good health? You think a man can call his homeboys and just cry on their shoulders? 
You think a man is going to go and sit up underneath another man and rub his back and tell him that everything's going to be okay? Men don't have movie night. We have fight night. We have game night. We have domino night. And there will be no sensitive conversation or topics. Men don't try to cheer up other men. We don't have a support system. We're taught to move on. Suck it up. Get another hoe. Not taught to heal. My personal evolution was in process, but I still had some growing to do. After Danielle, I let the anger get the best of me. I started to become more and more aware that in order to become emotionally stable, I had to first learn how to manage my anger. So all I got is me. I sit and I reflect. My mind replaying different scenes from our relationship. I blame Danielle for many things that happened. I comfort myself by saying that she is at home crying over our lost relationship. Her friends crying with her. I comfort myself by saying she is already regretting our breakup and that she will be back begging for me to return. And the best part of it all, as far as I'm concerned, in my moment of anger and frustration, a new woman. That's what I'll do. I will go out and get a new woman. So when Danielle comes back crying, I will send her on her way. I will not want her because I already have moved on. Instead of taking time to heal from a major breakup, I go out on the prowl. I meet a woman at the gas station on the way home named Danielle. Faith, right? We have sex the next day. Helps me close the door on Danielle number one. Danielle number two got it going on. If I could just make my mind up to be single forever, I would be happy. Only problem is women have two things I need, sex and kids. If I didn't like the booty so much, if I didn't like the booty so much, I would have stopped worrying about women a long time ago. If I could have kids of my own, I would never be caught arguing with no woman. Forget them, man. Don't want them. Don't need them. Don't like them. They get on my damn nerves. Only 45% of marriages survive. Probably half of that 45% are only still together because they're legally bound or have kids. Meaning if somebody could just wake up and walk out, they would do it. I wonder what percentage of relationships make it to marriage. What percentages of real relationships that is, meaning that there's love both ways, both people at least thinking about marriage. I wonder what percentage of relationships end with the cuss out. I know I've been cussed out about 85% of the time when I break up with a woman. A scorned woman has one of the filthiest mouths ever. She might be this little cute little thing, all lovey-dovey, sweetie pie, and tell you tell her it's over, and then she just lets the words fly. Fuck you. Fuck you, you bitch-ass motherfucker. Really? I mean, really? You're gonna leave me? Ha! <laughs> whatever fuck you punk ass motherfucker you ain't shit i'm the best thing that ever happened to you how are you gonna leave me fuck you why don't relationships work is it because people change maturity growth development new wants new needs not enough sacrifice lack of dedication lack of effort lack of appreciation no commitment relationship training no good relationship role models why commit anyway no guarantees in this relationship game chances are that this relationship is not going to work not going to last why try why invest i will give you something good but i'm not going to give you my best why give my best if i don't know if you're giving me your best you might be holding back that's what happens in a lot of relationships today. These are all questions I've asked myself. There are also questions that many of you have asked yourself. I'll share the answers as we go further in this relationship journey. But for now, just think about what's most important or meaningful in relationships. What was the reason that you think your relationship ended? Now, looking back, do you still think that it was a reason it ended? Or has distance given you a different perspective on why your relationship ended? Chapter 10. Friends and lovers. So I'm back to dating. I've learned a bit from my previous experiences, but this is no overnight transformation. I don't go from making a lot of relationship mistakes one day to being perfect the next, but I am showing growth. See, my conscience actually plays a role this time around. I decide that I'm going to be a better man, better for the women and better for me. No more hurting women. My heart just can't take it anymore. Since I've been hurt, I can feel their pain when I hurt them. I used to be able to turn my back and leave, just bounce, not care, not be concerned. Since my heart has been broken, it's becoming harder and harder to break someone else's heart. Seeing a woman cry the other day almost brought me to tears. And I ain't even like her. I don't want to hurt any more women. I'm going to have to be honest with myself and more honest with them. I have to have my own dating rules. If she's not marriage material, I can't date her. No matter how fine she is. Ooh, that's going to be tough. The moment I make up my mind that I can't be with a woman long term, I have to leave that woman. I'm going to have to be more disciplined. 
I'm going to have to say, no, no, you can't come over. No, we can't go out. No, you can't cook for me. I can't let them like me too much too fast. I got to slow them down. I'm not going to string them along. I'm just saying I'm not going to be trying to make it work or trying to understand her or explain me. I'm going to protect her from me. I have got to go through a metamorphosis. I can't do what I used to do when it comes to women. I can't date how I used to date. Usually, I'm cooking for women and sending them flowers. To them, it means the world. To me, I'm just doing what my mama taught me. So instead of doing what I normally do, I have to think about what I'm doing and what it will mean to them. Women are always trying to figure out what a dude is thinking, interpreting everything I do, contemplating on the moves I haven't made. I got to be careful. I'm, I'm only rubbing your feet because you said these dogs hurt, not because I super like you. I like rose petal baths too. You just company. I am not about to pull out a ring from the drain and propose. Yes. I'm spending time with you. I'm enjoying this time. But that does not mean I want to spend the rest of my life with you. It only means that you cool. That you cool right now for the day. So during the week, it's mostly me by myself chilling at the crib. Cook dinner for myself and watch some TV. The phone rings. But I pass on that insignificant conversation. Not tonight. Not most nights. I'm a homebody now. It's weird being half pimp and half homeboy. I'm only dating on the weekends because I'm trying to be careful about spending too much time with a woman. Very careful about who I date. I cut the ones that want to get married this afternoon. I cut the ones that my mama probably not going to like. I cut the ones that I've been dating for longer than three months. If we don't have a whole relationship thing popped off in three months, chances are it's not going down. I'm probably just not feeling you like that. I'm left with nothing. No honeys. Starting from scratch. Got to revamp the whole team. Needed an overhaul anyway. I am finding that I can spend time with my homegirls. They just happen to be female. When I spend time with them, it takes the place or it takes away that need I have to have of being around a woman all the time. Today, I'm a happy hour with my homegirl, Cleo. We chilling, discussing my debacle of a dating life. She's laughing at me like she always does, talking about how crazy I am. And then she says, you are a really good catch, James. Too bad for them. I'm like, huh? Uh, It was just something about the way she said it. I look her in the eyes and I see that spark for a minute. Then it fades away. I'm caught off guard by her statement. She can't be trying to holler at the kid. I tried to holler at her years ago, but she wasn't interested. Is she trying to double back? She might be trying to put it out there and see if I bite. A couple weeks later, I'm hanging out with the fellas and she shimmies on in. She looking good. The DJ is hot, but the turnout is whack. There is not one dime piece in the building. So I just end up dancing with my homegirl, Cleo. We dancing crazy, having fun like normal. Then the DJ put on that juvenile. Back that thing up. You know, you know what happened. She's following juvenile's instructions. And Cleo fine too. She got that big juicy badonka donk. It's on and popping. I poke her with the swollen big worm two, three, four times. She moves in. She feel a poke. She feeling it. Green light. It's on. Now, I pause. Whoa, hold up. It's my homegirl. I'm nervous. I cherish our friendship. When I have problems with other women, I talk to Cleo about them first. If I date Cleo, I can't talk to Cleo about Cleo. We run in the same circles. Everyone will know we're dating. What if it doesn't work? I could lose a good friend. I don't even know how to make the first move. What if I'm mistaken? What if she be playfully poking people? All the time when she dancing, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I never really poked a friend before. Maybe it's because she got that extra ball dunk dunk that she don't feel a poke. Nah, man, she felt that poke, bro. You think so? Yeah. Yeah, man, she, you right, man, she, she felt it. It is, it is big worm, if it was little worm, maybe she wouldn't have felt it. But I just, I still just don't, I'm not ready to approach her. I punk out, I'm just gonna chill. But then later when I got home that night, I gave Cleo a call. Hey, girl, this is James. What's up, homie? Nothing. Try not to have road rage. Stupid people can't even drive today. Get on my nerves. What's going on with you? I feel like I've been getting some vibes from you, girl. <laughs> what kind of vibes? Like you trying to holler at your boy. <laughs> what are you talking about? You trying to holler at your boy. Me? You want to holler at me, huh? What? You crazy. Ain't nobody worried about you, boy. What, make you, what, what made you think that? The other day at the club, you was up on her, brother, backing that thing up. Oh, so a sister can't get her groove on. I mean, I was just dancing. What's wrong? You can't handle it. Oh, oh okay. All right. All right. You, you mess around and get poked. What if I want to get poked? 
what you gonna do? What are you and Big Worm gonna do something? Hold, 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 hold on, hold on, home girl. Don't be having Big Worm all, all all up in your mouth. Don't don't do that unless you want him all up in your mouth. Mm, I don't know where that little baby worm been. <laughs> you crazy. That's what I like about you. You make me laugh. What else you like about me? I like how you treat women. You respectful and you caring. You kind of sweet. I've seen you with your woman in the past. I like what I see. Okay, enough of the bullshit. You trying to holler at me or what? You you go with the compliments, jocking me or what? Now, what's good? Honestly, I have been kind of feeling you, but I'm concerned about the friendship. Okay, on a serious tip, I care about you a lot, and, you know, you as a friend, you sure you want to make this step? I mean, we could lose our friendship. Sure, only if you do something stupid and blow it, and there's a strong possibility of that occurring. We take things slow at first. It was our intention to keep it that way. I want to be careful with Cleo. I don't want to hurt her. Cleo knew me through my player days. Player, player days. She is as cautious as I am. We start spending more and more time together. It's only natural we're good friends. We have a lot in common. Shoot, I have to pass her house on the way to get to mine, so I end up stopping by quite often. Either I was over there or she was chilling at my spot. We don't even have to get to know each other. We don't have any trust issues. We already know each other. We already trust each other. We have a mutual respect. We basically had the same personality. Both fun, both intelligent, both trying to understand what God is doing with our lives. Both homeowners, both of us trying to figure out why we aren't married with kids. There's only one outstanding question, one unsolved mystery. One thing that we both have to know because everything else is perfect. We have mad chemistry. We respect each other's space and time. We hardly ever disagree. That that That's how it is when you date your friend. You know, you already know each other. Everything just fits. However, there is one thing that you cannot know about each other, no matter how good your friendship is. You could be friends for 10,000 years and you still will never know if I can hit it right. She didn't hear all the rumors about Big Worm, but we don't know how Big Worm gonna match with Cleo. So what had happened was... Shit, you know your boy knocked it out the box. It was a phenomenal performance. At one point, I had to look down and say, damn, Big Worm, do your thing, player. Big Worm was hard as a cast iron skillet, vibrating like grandma's old washer. Lasted all night long. Lasted longer than the night before Christmas. I have gone and provided this 37-year-old woman with her first orgasmic experience ever. She had long ago, long, long, long ago, given up on her dream of having an orgasm. But I made her dream come true. She sprung like Jack in a box. A week later, we in public holding hands. Everybody knows we're together. I'm cooking again at the crib, back to rubbing feet, giving massages, and making those rose petal baths. We spend every single day together, every single night together. It's not required or asked. Both of us want to do it. We enjoy each other's company. A week later, her mother visits. I'm introduced. Meeting mom goes well. Next thing you know, our casual conversation turns into a serious one. Marriage. We are a month in. Wow. We don't really talk about us getting married or talk dates or anything like that. I just tell her what I want in a woman, the type of woman I want to marry. I describe her to the T and didn't even notice until she brought it up. She takes it a step further. She flat out says that she loves me and that she's loved me for some time and she wants to marry me. And whenever I ask, she's ready. I knew she loved me, but this is my first time hearing it. Hearing her say it makes all the difference. It makes me feel different. I'm speechless. I just hold her close to me. Hearing that from her makes me realize that I don't love her and I won't love her. Not for a while, at least. I'm still in love with somebody else. I am still in love with Danielle. Guess who calls the next day? Danielle starts off slowly. We have insignificant conversation. You know, the how are you? How's your mama them? What you been up to lately? So I cut to the chase. So Danielle, what made you call me today? Well, I haven't talked to you in a while and I miss you. Oh, really? Yes, I miss you a lot. I wanted to know if you thought we could work it out between us. Kind of give it a second chance. Oh, you're not wasting no time today, huh? You're just going to jump right in. Well, I'm with somebody else now, and I'm happy with her. It's too late. James, I know you still love me. As long as you still love me, it is never too late for us. I know now that I will always love you. Why do you know that now? You didn't know that then. James, I made a mistake. Please, give us another chance. I can't do that. It's too late now. There's someone else now. I have to go. I'm glad that you are doing well. Thanks for calling. Can we please have dinner together and talk in person or something? Look me in my eyes and tell me that you don't want to be with me. Okay, Danielle. Okay. All right. We'll 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 meet. Um, Let me know when and where. We set a time and date. That afternoon, 
I sat down with Cleo to explain to her that I got to go and discuss some things with Danielle. I'm honest with Cleo. I keep it real. I tell her that I feel that I owe it to my past relationship with Danielle to pay her the respect of letting her speak her piece to me in person. My plan is to look Danielle in the eye, tell her that it's too late for us, that I've moved on, and I'm going to be with Cleo. Cleo says she understands. She has one request, that after I talk to Danielle, that I come straight to her house so we can have a conversation about what took place. So I'm on my way to meet Danielle. I get to the restaurant 15 minutes early. Danielle is already at our table. She's already crying. She starts admitting to things that, that, that she did wrong. She keeps apologizing over and over again. She tells me that she cannot live without me. She's tried. She says I'm right about everything, that everything is her fault. I'm completely caught off guard. I came here to end this for once and for all. I'm happy with Cleo. Cleo and I have a good thing going on. She's a good woman. I'm trying to gather the words to explain to Denise that I'm sorry. I can't give her another chance. I raise her chin and look deep into her eyes. Real deep. Too deep. I wipe the tears from her face. I start to cry also. Then we just end up holding each other. Nothing has to be said. We just know that we're meant to be together. We fixed two years of problems in 30 minutes at a restaurant table. Every problem I ever had. Every issue I ever had with Danielle, we meet halfway on. She agrees to everything. I compromise some things too. I recommit to our relationship. She says she'll do the same. As I drive home, I call Cleo. I tell her that I just need some space and some time to think over the conversation that I had with Danielle. Cleo loses it, goes berserk, starts yelling all sorts of obscenities at your man. Basically, she said, get your ass over here like you promised. She gives me two options. To go ahead and go home, and she's going to bring my shit, or I can come over there like she said, and we can talk about it. I try to bow guard. I try to just tell her, look, look, woman, I told you I'm going to come over there tomorrow. She hangs up in my face. Right after passionately making love to Danielle for the first time in months, I hear a knock at the door. It's 2.37 in the morning. Well, really, it's like somebody is banging at the door. Somebody trying to kick down my door. I'm thinking to myself, that can't be nobody but Cleo kicking down my door then i think damn who does she have with her banging like that she brought big shirley with her or something i peep through the peephole cleo's by herself for some reason i don't open the door i just yell through the door i'm scared i don't answer the door we show up my house in the middle of the night i don't know if she got a gun knife i don't know what her plan is so i ask her what are you doing she's like it, it's over and i brought your shit open the door i say no nah, i'm not opening the door i don't play that coming to my house in the middle of the night stuff I, i'm not opening the door she kicks my door, starts smashing all my cologne, CDs, dishes, shoes, anything, all of my stuff, just tossing my stuff on my door. Danielle walked in and she said, hey, what's going on? I quickly grabbed Danielle, escort her back to the room, get dressed so I can go meet Cleo. By the time I come back to the front door, Cleo is sped off. She's driving extremely fast and out of control. I decide to follow her home to make sure she arrives safely. As I pull out of my subdivision, I notice a car similar to Cleo's sitting on the side of the street. I slow down, pull over a couple feet right behind her. Why the hell is she just sitting in the car? At this point, I got a couple options. I can hop out of my car, walk over to her car, and try to talk to her. This option could lead to death by gunshot. I don't know if she got a gun. I'm scared. When women get mad and crazy, my other option is... It's just to call her cell phone, see if she'll talk. I call five times, no answer. Do I just walk over to her car? She's not even answering her phone. That's kind of scaring me even more. I'm a bona fide punk right now. She better flash her lights, hunk her horn or something. I'm not going over there. I'm not going to let this woman kill me tonight. Luckily, I got the Prince CD in the changer. I just sit back and chill and listen to Prince. I call my 10th time, no answer. Damn, no. Oh, no. Come on, man. No. The police done showed up. I'm about to go to jail. I ain't even done nothing. They walk over to her car first. Two more police cars show up. A seven foot nine, four hundred and eighty three pound half man, half police officer, half dinosaur heads my way. Man, I should have let her in the house and just took that ass whoop. At least I wouldn't be going to jail right now. She could smooth set me up right now. She could be telling the popos that I hit her, kicked her. Just man, this ain't gonna turn out good. License, insurance, and registration, please. Here you go, officer. How you doing this morning? What's going on here, man? My friend and I had a disagreement. A disagreement? Did you hit her? No, sir. I would never hit a woman. Stay right here. 
The officers meet and discuss. They let her drive off. Then they come over to my car. They give me the, you know you trifling look, right? I almost give them the, bitch, you don't know me. Take that badge off and we'll see what's good. But I chill. They instruct me to go home. I head toward my house. Then I decide that I need to settle this tonight with Cleo. It's 5 a.m. when I arrive at Cleo's house. I knock on the door. She's calmed down. She lets me in. No sharp objects in sight. I start explaining and lying and lying and explaining. I'm confusing myself trying to confuse her. I'm hoping that she's so tired I give her a headache and she just passes out with a confused state of mind. No luck. She looks at me and she just says, her or me. My cell phone is blowing up. Damn, Danielle is calling my cell phone. I ignore my cell phone. Danielle calls 15 more times. Then my homeboy calls. Damn, Danielle must have called him too. I keep explaining the line to Cleo. She not buying none of it. Then Danielle calls Cleo on her cell phone. Cleo just ignores it. Then Cleo's home phone rings. Finally, I just tell I just tell Cleo I got to go. She threatens me that if I leave, to never come back. There's no point in trying to explain to Cleo anything else. My heart has already chosen, even if my mind hasn't. I have to follow my heart. Danielle must have got all of Cleo's numbers off my caller ID. Told y'all earlier I hate caller ID. Caller ID always getting the player caught up. I just leave, man. That ride home was the toughest ride of my life. I almost turn around twice. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm leaving a good woman, but the one I love is at my house. Cleo is down for me. Cleo will never take me back after tonight. She can't. I had to be sure that Danielle was who I wanted. I'm sure. I think. If I'm making a mistake, I'm going to pay for it the rest of my life. I choose Danielle. I love Danielle. I always did love Danielle. I always have. I always will. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter that I'm leaving a good woman. Not the problems that Danielle and I had in the past. Nothing matters. None of the issues matter. We're going to work it all out. I love her. I follow my heart. I left Cleo because I love Danielle. I'm going to marry Danielle. It's time. I'm ready. I know that we can survive through anything now. When I get back home, Danielle was gone. There was a letter on the bed. I still got the letter hole up. Don't, don't trip if your man get choked up. James, no matter how much I love you, I know that I deserve better than you. I can't take this. I can't take you back. It's over. You don't know what you want, and I deserve better. Since the moment that I met you, I've known what I wanted. My feelings have never changed. I've always wanted you. I was confident that in time, that today, that you would figure out what you wanted. But after leaving me here tonight to go be with another woman, I know that you will never know what you want. I will always love you. Never call me again. Wait, you lost both your women? Yeah, man, it was it was tough on your boy. Divorce Not Option Podcast, Stephen James Dixon, Tamara Glaspie. Appreciate you guys listening. You can subscribe to the podcast on SoundCloud, on YouTube, on iTunes, on Google Play. Please, please, please subscribe for us. That is how we generate revenue. That is how the marketing folks understand, you know, how many listeners we have and things of that nature. So I need you to subscribe. And what happens when you subscribe is you will automatically get a new message or an email or an update to your phone whenever I post a new podcast. So definitely appreciate people um, doing that for me. God bless. Uh, Talk to you next week.